Hey everybody, welcome back to our chapter book read along of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. So we are now on chapter 10, but we need to do a quick review. So there is a lot of book to cover. So pause the video if you can and talk about what we have read so far with those who you are watching this with. If not, here goes my quick review. Harry Potter is the boy who lived. He is a wizard who survived being attacked by an evil dark wizard named Voldemort when he was just a baby. Sadly, his parents died and he had to go live with the Dursleys, who are muggles, non-magic folk, and not very nice at all. His aunt, his uncle, and his cousin. When Harry turned 11, he finally received his letter to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and learned that he is a wizard. His new friend Hagrid took him to Diagon Alley where they went to Gringotts Wizard Bank and then shopping for all of his school supplies. He then rode the Hogwarts Express to Hogwarts and started his learning. He met a few friends along the way, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, Neville Longbottom, and a few others, and learned that wizarding is not so simple. He has a lot of professors, and he is learning lots from them. Professor McGonagall, Flitwick, Binns, Professor Sprout, Professor Snape, and Professor Dumbledore, who is the headmaster. Now, we just saw Harry doing a dive on a broomstick because a bully named Draco Malfoy stole something of Neville Longbottom's. Well, Harry thought he was going to get in trouble, but he didn't. He was asked to join the Quidditch team. So we are about to learn, along with Harry Potter, what is Quidditch? All right, here comes Chapter 10 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Enjoy! Chapter 10 Halloween Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry, Ron... Let's start that again. <clears throat> Chapter 10 Halloween Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts the next day, looking tired but perfectly cheerful. Indeed, by the next morning, Harry and Ron thought that meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure, and they were quite keen to have another one. In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to be unmoved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron. Or both, said Harry. But as they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long. They didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville or Hermione showed the slightest interest in what lay beneath the dog and the trap door. All Neville cared about was never going near that dog again. Hermione was now refusing to speak and to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as an added bonus. All they really wanted now was to stay was a way of getting back at Malfoy. And to their great delight, just such a thing arrived in the post about a week later. As the owls flooded into the great hall as usual, everyone's attention was caught by, at once, by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was that large parcel, and was amazed when the owls soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. They had hardly fluttered out of the way when another owl dropped a letter on top of the parcel. Harry ripped open the letter first, which was lucky because it read, Do not open the parcel at the table. 
It contains your new Nimbus 2000, but I don't want everybody knowing you've got a broomstick or they'll all want one. Oliver Wood will meet you tonight on the Quidditch pitch at 7 o'clock for your first training session. Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had difficulty hiding his glee as he handed the note to Ron to read. A Nimbus 2000, Ron moaned enviously. Never even touched one. They left the hall quickly, wanting to unwrap the broomstick in private before their first lesson. But they were halfway across the entrance hall. They found the way upstairs barred by Crab and Goyle. Malfoy seized the package from Harry and felt it. That's a broomstick, he said, throwing it back at Harry with a mixture of jealousy and spite on his face. You'll be for it this time, Potter. First years aren't allowed to have them. Ron couldn't resist it. It's not any old broomstick, he said. It's a Nimbus 2000. What did you say you've got at home, Malfoy? A Comet 260? Ron grinned at Harry. Comets look flashy, but they're not the same league as the Nimbus. What would you know about it, Weasley? You couldn't afford half the handle, Malfoy snapped back. I suppose you and your brothers have to save up twig by twig. Before Ron could answer, Professor Flitwick appeared at Malfoy's elbow. Not arguing, I hope, boys, he squeaked. Potter's been giving a broomstick, Professor, said Malfoy quickly. Yes, yes, that's right, said Professor Flitwick, beaming at Harry. Professor McGonagall told me all about the special circumstances, Potter. And what model is it? A Nimbus 2000, sir said Harry, fighting not to laugh at the look of horror on Malfoy's face. And it's really thanks to Malfoy here that I've got it, he added. Harry and Ron headed upstairs, smothering their laughter at Malfoy's obvious rage and confusion. Well, it's true, Harry laughed as they reached the top of the marble staircase. If he hadn't stolen Neville's rememberal, I wouldn't be on the team. So I suppose you think that's a reward for breaking rules, came an angry voice from behind them. Hermione was stomping up the stairs, looking disapprovingly at the package in Harry's hand. I thought you weren't speaking to us, said Harry. Yes, don't stop now, said Ron. It's doing us so much good. Hermione marched away with her nose in the air. Harry had a lot of trouble keeping his mind on his lessons that day kept wandering up to the dormitory, where his new broomstick was lying under his bed, or straying off to the Quidditch pitch, where he'd be learning to play that night. He bolted his dinner that evening without noticing what he was eating, and then rushed upstairs with Ron to unwrap the Nimbus 2000 at last. Wow, Ron sighed as the broomstick rolled onto Harry's bedspread. Even Harry, who knew nothing about different brooms, thought it looked wonderful, sleek and shiny, with a mahogany handle. It had a long tail of neat straight twigs and Nimbus 2000 written in gold near the top. As seven o'clock drew nearer, Harry left the castle and set off towards the Quidditch pitch at dusk. He'd never been inside the stadium before. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands around the pitch, so the spectators were high enough to see what was going on. At either end of the pitch, there were three golden poles with hoops on the end. They reminded Harry of the little plastic sticks muggle children blew bubbles through, except they were about 50 feet high. Too eager to fly again to wait for wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off the ground. What a feeling! He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the pitch. The Nimbus 2000 turned whenever he wanted to with the slightest touch. Hi, Potter! Come down! Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall meant. You really are a natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening, 
and then you'll be joining team practices three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now, Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chasers. Three chasers, Harry repeated, as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a football or soccer ball. This ball's called the quaffle, said Wood. The chasers throw the quaffle to each other and try to get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points every time the quaffle goes through one of the hoops. Follow me? The chasers throw the quaffle and put it through the hoops to score, Harry recited. So, that's sort of like basketball on broomsticks with six hoops, isn't it? What's basketball? said Wood curiously. Uh, Never mind, said Harry quickly. Now, there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other team from scoring. Three chases, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all. And they play with the quaffle. Okay, I've got that. What are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club, a bit like a rounder's bat. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, he said. These two are bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, the black ball rose high in the air, then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it with the bat to stop it breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away in the air. It zoomed around their heads, then shot at Wood who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. See? Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rock it around, trying to knock players off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on the team. The Weasley twins are ours. It's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try to knock them towards the other team. So, think you've got all that? Three chasers try to score with the quaffle. The keeper guards the goalposts. The beaters keep the bludgers away from their team. Harry reeled off. Very good, said Wood. Uh, have the bludgers ever killed anyone? Harry asked, hoping he didn't sound offhand. Never at Hogwarts. We've had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now, the last member of the team is the seeker. That's you. And you don't have to worry about the quaffle or the bludgers. Unless they crack my head open. Don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was a tiny, tiny ball about the size of a walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering silver wings. This, said Wood, is the golden snitch, and it's the most important ball of the lot. It's very hard to catch because it's so fast and difficult to see. It's the seeker's job to catch it. You've got to weave in and out of the chasers, beaters, bludgers, and quaffle to get it before the other team seeker, because... Whichever seeker catches the snitch wins his team an extra 150 points. So they nearly always win. That's why seekers get fouled so much. A game of Quidditch only ends when the snitch is caught, so it can go on for ages. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing in substitutes so the players could get some sleep. Well, that's it. Any questions? Harry shook his head. He understood what he had to do all right. It was doing it that was the problem. We won't practice with the snitch yet, he said Wood, carefully shutting it back inside the crate. 
It's too dark and we might lose it. Let's try it with a few of these. He pulled a bag of ordinary golf balls out of his pocket, and a few minutes later, he and Harry were up in the air, Wood throwing the golf balls as hard as he could in every direction for Harry to catch. Harry didn't miss a single one, and Wood was delighted. After a half an hour, night had really fallen, and they couldn't carry on. "'That Quidditch couple have our name on it this year,' said Wood happily as they trudged back up to the castle. I wouldn't be surprised if you turn out better than Charlie Weasley, and he could have played for England if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons. I hope you all enjoyed the first half of Chapter 10, Halloween, from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We will finish the rest of the chapter in our next video. But now, let's discuss what we read. What did Harry receive in the Owl Post, so the mail, from Professor McGonagall. He got a broomstick, didn't he? What type of broom was it? Let's see if I can find the picture. It was a Nimbus 2000, which doesn't mean much to us, but imagine the most impressive bike or maybe car that you can think of. And this is top of the line right there. The Nimbus 2000. So we learn the rules to Quidditch, don't we? What are some of those rules to this silly flying game? There's the hoops. Really like that picture. There are a couple different positions, right? There's a chaser, a beater, a keeper, and a seeker. So they, see this little picture of the type of things? The red one is the quaffle that the chasers get, and they throw it through those hoops that we saw. The keeper blocks the hoops so the other team doesn't score. The big ones on the side here with the chains on them are the bludgers. The beaters use these bats to hit them at people to try to knock them off or move out of the way so they miss. And then this little guy is the golden snitch. The seeker has to find it and that ends the game. Do you remember how many points you get if you catch a golden snitch? 150. And you get 10 points when a quaffle goes through the hoop. So, usually if a team catches the snitch, they win. Because you wouldn't catch it if you're down enough points to lose, right? So, it sounds complicated, but it's not too bad. What position is Harry Potter going to play? He is going to be the seeker. So he has to catch that tiny little golden zooming ball. So we'll see how that works out later. I hope you enjoyed this part of the chapter and we will continue chapter 10, Halloween of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone in our next chapter book read along. Bye everyone.